please welcome Dr. Mike Dorkin. Uh, thank you all, and uh, thank you all for coming back uh, so promptly. Sorry to squeeze in in lunch, but um, we don't need lunch anyway. Uh, uh, so this morning, uh, we've been uh, listening to conversations and systems have come up a lot. System management, systems uh, failures, uh, how can we prove, uh, improve our whole approach um, at multiple levels at the same time. Um, in the UK, uh, we had an opportunity to, to look at a series of events that were taking place. Um, and uh, as a result of that, one of the recommendations was that we should uh, create the role and post of patient safety commissioner. Uh, uh, and this role was hard fought for. There are a lot of people who wanted to take up this opportunity, um, act not just as an activist, as a, as a champion, but also as an architect, uh, an architect of a shift in the system and the shift in the way uh, we work with patients and also we work with our own healthcare workers. So it's a real privilege for me to introduce um, Dr. Henrietta Hughes, uh, who is the Patient Safety Commissioner for England, um, uh, but also has responsibility as, as such for the whole system um, and the relationships between uh, patients and the whole system as far as their safety is concerned. Uh, Henrietta came last year and listened to the story of Paul Martha uh, who died uh, as a result of uh, neglect, uh, as a result of people not listening to her parents, her mother in particular. Um, and Henrietta then worked closely back in England, came here, listened to Mary Opie speak, went back to England and created uh, a whole new system approach, systematic approach to supporting patients with similar system issues. So I won't say any more, but I'd like to now introduce you to Dr. Henrietta Hughes, who is going to talk to us for the next few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Henrietta Hughes. Thank you so much. Mike, and thank you very much for inviting me back again. I feel that it's a real privilege to be here uh, two years in a row. If I could have my slides up, please. So I've called this listening to patients because that's what my role is all about. It's about listening to patients and elevating patients and families' voices direct into the heart of government. My role is appointed by the Secretary of State for Health in England, but I'm accountable to Parliament. I have an independent role and I'm able to challenge and support whoever it is in the system that I believe is the, the part of the system that can fix the problem. So my role, as, as Mike said, arose out of um, a problem where patients hadn't been heard. And um, I have three main areas that I'm responsible for, promoting patient safety, promoting the value of listening to patients. And as a family physician myself, I found this slightly bemusing when I saw this in the job description. I thought it was kind of obvious, but clearly it isn't. And this is all in relation to medicines and medical devices. And um, when I was here last year, I was sitting on the white sofa, or as I call it, the seat of power. And uh, Joe Keone asked me, what does a patient safety commissioner do? So I'm glad to be back to be able to fill in some of those gaps. And earlier in the uh, year, I published my strategy, a revised strategy, which has three main strands. One of those is about the alignment of the healthcare culture. And we've heard a lot this morning already about the culture and how important that is to have a just and learning culture, one where leaders um, prioritize patient safety and we work in a collaborative way to uh, solve the problems, the system problems with system solutions. The next strand is around the patient voice in their own care and how important this is in terms of consent, in terms of transparency. 
And the final strand is around the patient's voice in the design and delivery of healthcare. And part of that is cross-sector learning and learning from global partners, which is why I'm so pleased to be here today. And I'm going to touch a little on the, prin the principles of better patient safety. Um, my public consultation closes in about three hours. So um, I'll have a QR code on the last slide if anybody would like to respond to that. But my, one of my statutory responsibilities is to create a set of principles, overarching principles around patient safety that can act as a North Star for the whole system to, to, to really come behind and, and work together for patients. So some of you may have spotted in the, uh, the middle strand of my strategy around Martha's rule. And um, as Mike very uh, helpfully described, this arose out of the conversations that I had and other really important events that happened around this time last year in England. So you, if you were here last year, you will have seen the, the movie and uh, heard from Martha's mother. Martha was a, a young teenager who was on a family holiday and was riding her bicycle and there was some sand on the path and she slipped and the handlebar of the bike went deep into her abdomen, causing a pancreatic injury. And she was initially admitted to a hospital in Wales and then transferred to a teaching hospital in London, in England. And although her care, uh, her, her, her symptoms deteriorated and, and Martha and her parents both tried to escalate and flag these to her treating team, they weren't listened to. And, and very sadly, Martha's condition deteriorated so severely and then she died. And um, sitting with, with Marope and hearing her uh, account of what had happened, um, I had read about it and I was aware of it, but it really struck me as something that should never happen. You should never have a situation where uh, a patient is raising concerns about their own condition and being ignored by those who were there to protect them and keep them safe and make them well. At the time, when I was uh, back in, in England, uh, we also had the verdict of a murder trial of Lucy Letby. And um, this caused you know, a lot of conversations to be had where Lucy Letby uh, was a, a neonatal nurse who was convicted ultimately of um, murdering babies in her care. And so the Secretary of State asked to speak to all the patient safety leaders to say, you know, what, what do we need to do? What are, the, what are the top things that we need to do? And when I spoke to him, one of the, the three things that I said was we need to put Martha's rule into place. And Merope and her husband and, and, and her supporters had been trying to get traction with Martha's rule in England for quite some time. And, and then a few days later, which was actually uh, almost exactly a year ago on Martha's birthday, Merope, who is a journalist herself, was interviewed on our flagship radio program called the Today Program, which is listened to by about six million people every day. And her interview went right through the weather report. It went right through the news. It went right through everything. And it was such a compelling and a shocking account, the same as she had given here, that it galvanized the politicians into action. And the Secretary of State said, we're going to look into this. And he called me in to see him and said, Henrietta, would you run a series of policy sprints to make Martha's rule a success in England? And I just remind you, I'm a family physician. I'm not a policy uh, expert. So of course I said, I'd love to, absolutely. And then I rang my husband and I said, what is a policy sprint? And he said, oh, it's all about Spotify and cutting code and a minimum viable product. And I said, I still know no more than when I asked you. Um, but I did you know, rapid reading and learning to educate myself. And I realized that what it took to do this was to bring everyone together and hear from everyone to be able to make the right policy to make this a success in England. And, you know, this is a collaborative effort. The whole system approach, we have hundreds of hospitals, we have dozens of regulators, professional regulators, royal colleges, um, national bodies, etc. And by working together, 
um, over a very rapid period of 18 days, um, we looked, answered some really important questions about this and came up uh, with the policy which I presented back to the Secretary of State and he accepted it. So there are three elements to this. We've heard about real-time data, but we've also heard about how important it is to have that low-tech aspect of it, that low-tech aspect of listening to the patient and hearing from them. Do they feel well? Do they feel ill? Do they feel better or worse than the last time they were asked? Because we know that if you have that structured approach to lis listening, you can identify deterioration 12 to 24 hours before the news scores deteriorate. The second element is for all staff to have 24-7 access to a critical care outreach team to be able to escalate concerns about care and get a rapid review of the patient's condition. And when I say all staff, I'm talking about the nurses on the ward, the housekeepers, the porters, the cleaners, the doctors, the physios, anyone on the ward who is concerned about the patient's condition can ring and get a rapid review. And the Martha's rule element of this is that the patients and families have access to that same escalation process. If they're concerned that they're not being listened to and they have worries about deterioration, they can also call for a rapid review from the critical care outreach team. The next step was then getting this so that it was implemented across England and working with system partners, national bodies. We now have a pilot where 100 hospital sites were invited to take part. And the reason I say invited is so important is because this is a cultural intervention. You can have all of this policy, you can have all of these processes happening, but unless you have the cultural intervention to make this work with the leaders, that communication going out all the way into communities as well as, as, as with staff, with the patients and others on the ward, it's never going to work. What I was delighted was that 143 hospital sites put themselves forward for this. And we're now starting to see this being implemented. There are some really big barriers that get in the way. I heard earlier today about psychological safety and about how we can encourage the staff on the ward and also the patients and families to feel really comfortable about picking up the phone and not to feel that things are gonna go badly wrong for them if they do so. We also know that it's really important that this is widely inclusive, that if a family as articulate as Martha's parents could not get that message across, what about those who have English as a second language or who don't have that articulacy, who maybe um, are, have visual problems or, or hearing problems and have real struggles to get their, their views across? And so working nationally and with providers across England, we're developing a comms um, package for staff, for patients and for families, taking account of community languages, taking account of those barriers that might prevent people from feeling comfortable to use this system. We're developing evidence as we go through and the Secretary of State, a different Secretary of State, asked me to chair the oversight group meeting. So every month I meet together with all of those stakeholders you see on that previous slide, with the family, with the Patients Association, with all of the parts of the system who are there to create the success for Martha's Rule. What's been fantastic about this is the transparency of this process that's been so welcomed by people um, as part of this system so that we can see the, where the barriers are, we can see where the enablers are, and that convening role that I have to bring together parts of the system who otherwise possibly wouldn't always be in the room together. The other areas that I wanted to talk about was about why this is important, not just to make it safer for patients, but as Don talked about earlier, that moral injury, that harm, that, that impact on the well-being of staff when they're working in systems that are unsafe when through no fault of their own, something happens because they were never told, they didn't know, it was different from the place they worked before. And what this does is by having this happening at a national level, it means that whether you're moving from one hospital to another, we shall have the same systems so people feel familiar with it and they can 
uh, know how to do things and what to do. And that's why I think it's safer for all. It's an intentional system. It's not a safety management system. I wouldn't go as far as that. But it's being designed to keep people safe rather than waiting for things to go wrong and doing the investigation. So that brings me on to the principles of better patient safety. Part of my, uh, my, my legislative requirement is that I go out to public consultation on this. And we've had hundreds of responses. And one of the things that I found already that is interesting when we've been looking at some of the responses that have been coming back is, and, and the comments that people have made to me, is depending on how vulnerable people feel in the system, the more they welcome the principles. So whether that's the chief exec of a hospital who wants to have uh, something to point at when they're being asked to do something which is about finance or operational performance, they want something to point at that says, but the patient safety commissioner has said, I have to do this to follow the principles of better patient safety. Somebody said to me, how can I use these principles? What, what will I do with them? And I said, well, you know, if that's something which is your you know, your guide to do the right thing. And they said, that's right. If I'm doing this according to the patient safety principles, I know I'm doing the good thing. So I'm looking forward to when we have published these uh, later in the year in October. But when I look at all the different aspects that I'm involved in, whether that's around patient consent, whether that's around transparency, whether it's to do with reporting, listening to patients or bringing patients into the room to design and deliver healthcare. What I see as the overarching themes in all of these is it's leadership is the one thing that makes all the difference. Leaders who are engaged, leaders who are passionate, and leaders who are visible and who communicate and engage with patients, families, and their workforce. Listening, the listening aspect is so important, but it's not enough just to listen. You have to then do something with it. And that's where I feel very excited about the Martha's Rule work that we're doing because essentially this is working in partnership, working in partnership with patients, with family members, with colleagues, and with representatives. So thank you so much for having me back. I'm delighted to update you on what's happened since I was sitting on the white sofa last year with Merope, and I really hope to be able to give you updates as we bring this into place across the whole of England. Thank you.